Today on my channel, we are going to take a stock 350 Chevy with crappy stock heads and crappy stock rocker arms and crappy stock push rods and a crappy mild cam barely above stock that barely opens the valves. And we are going to wave our magic push rod and we are going to turn this into something that actually makes power. This engine made 250 horsepower on the dyno and we are and there you have it. It's a good thing we got this done because uh, yeah I was really limited on time and we were gonna lose the shop if I didn't get it done so that's really all there is to doing this upgrade according to like every single hot rodding show you start out with a worn out nasty engine and you end up with something like this in about 30 minutes. So obviously they left a bunch of stuff out. So I've got a bunch of video. I shot the entire process of building this thing up. So I'm gonna take you back to the beginning and we're gonna start and I'm gonna show you exactly what we did. We put a ISKI, a big ISKI roller cam in it. It's a hydraulic roller. We got Edelbrock heads, we got roller rockers, we got hardened push rods, and we're going to put all this greatness on top. We got a high rise single plane Edelbrock intake with a 750 CFM quick fuel Holley carburetor. And we are going to put this thing on the dyno and see what happens. We made 250 with this same short block with the, all the crappy parts on it. Now we're going to put it back on the dyno after this top end upgrade and see what she'll do. So I hope you enjoy this. Uh, Hey, welcome back everybody. Today I've got um, uh, some stuff I want to talk about. I've got a small block Chevrolet engine here, but it's not your typical small block. Now, let me tell you what we've got here. This is a, a Dart aftermarket 350 or small block Chevy. Could be, you could make it into a 383 or whatever you want. This is, is a, an engine that we the bottom end is, is really stout on this thing, although we'll probably change some stuff when we take it apart. But the thing is, the this engine has stock 76cc chamber, just plain Jane factory 350 heads on it. In fact, the, the casting number is 624. It's a 624 head cylinder head that was made at the plant in Mexico. So it's basically a crate motor set of heads right that were brand new from GM uh, they are very typical of any cylinder head made throughout the, the 1970s which had an open chamber small ports they were rated at about 220 horsepower now here's the thing um, one of the things you got to understand is this is a dart block capable of well handling well over you know a thousand twelve hundred horsepower However, it only made on the dyno about 250-ish horsepower, right? We upgraded the cam a little bit. We had a better intake on it. The, the thing about this is, guys, is you can have a really bulletproof lower end, like this dart block that's capable of handling a bunch of power. But if you have stock heads and basically stock induction system and exhaust, the fact that you have a really expensive short block under here doesn't mean you're going to make any more power because the vast majority of the power of the engine is made by the heads the intake the exhaust the bottom end of the engine all it's really doing is just absorbing and transferring that power we, we really are short changing this short block here by using these stock heads on it so what I want to do today I want to take the top end off this engine and see how much we can improve and remember we 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 put this on the dyno, made about 250 horsepower. So we want to see how we can improve this by putting some good heads, good induction, and also a roller cam. We want to change this. This is a flat tap it cam. It's a it's an engine pro cam, and it's about 204, 214 duration of 50, with about 440, 450-ish lift. So really like a torque cam, like an RV type cam. And it's a flat tap it. So we want to, I'm going to go ahead and pull the heads and the cam and so forth off of this. And then we'll talk about the block a little bit once I get that down to the short block and see what we're dealing with. 
and I've got some really nice heads we can put on this. Then we're also gonna put a much bigger roller cam in this thing. So this video is kind of gonna be a tutorial on how to change your top end. And we'll talk about the, the block a little bit anyway. I think we're gonna change the pistons because we wanna keep this thing pump gas friendly and heads that have got have a really tight chamber. And with the flat top pistons that this has in it, I think we're gonna be out of the pump gas range. So we're probably gonna change the pistons and put a really decent dished piston in there to get our compression ratio down to a streetable pump gas type level. I wanna keep this thing pump gas friendly because that's what most of you are doing. You know, you can build it up and put a dome piston or you leave the flat top in there and then you have to go buy, you know, race gas, which is, you know, $8 a gallon. And I know most people don't wanna do that. I want to make big power or much better power, I should say, on pump gas because this is something that you can do. So I'll get the top end of this off and we'll get started. Off camera, I went ahead and disassembled the engine. We took off the oil pump. We took the cam and the, and the valve train parts out. Again, this is just a basically a, a flat tap at camshaft. We got our our flat tappet lifters here, and they're, they're fairly new. They didn't have that much time on them, so they're good. They're still good. We kept everything in order because these parts are great for a stock engine. And then, of course, we have our stock 76cc chamber heads that we have that we ran with this thing. So this is pretty typical of like just a mild, mildly upgraded stock headed 350 Chevy. The cam is an MC1730 Engine Pro. And like I said, it's got 204, 214 duration at 50, which is really mild. It's like one or two steps above stock. So, you know, smooth idle, just a little bit of an improvement, like a torque cam for a truck or an RV or something. Something you could just put in with stock springs and not have to worry about it. So nothing really crazy on the cam. And then of course, you know, the rest of this stuff is stock. But then we go over to our block. Now the nice thing is we did already have ARP studs in this thing. The gaskets don't look too bad. Didn't have any kind of leakage. So this thing was sealed up good. It was running good. The tune was pretty good. Might have been a little rich here. If we look at our, our gasket here, we did have a little bit of ish, few issues here with the water jacket. Some little bit of rust built up here. That's mainly because this just had water running in it on the dyno and it sat for a little while, but that's not a big issue. We're gonna clean all this up. And of course, we're running a, a flat top piston here with two valve reliefs. So the dart block is a little different than the stock small block. You'll notice it has a better cooling system and they also have three core plugs here. It has a much larger capacity cooling system. Now, if you look in the lifter valley as well, one thing you'll notice is, like on the later Vortec blocks, it has the provisions, the pedestals here, so you can use the GM spider assembly in here for the roller lifters. So you can use the dog bones here and put your spider assembly here. We're not gonna do that because we've already got a cam with tie bars, so you can use either one. Then when we go to the bottom side of the block, now the part number on this engine is a DRT047. It's very typical of their street performance block. One thing you'll notice on the bottom end is the forged steel splayed main caps. So it's got the three, it's the four bolt main with the splayed main caps. I already took one of these bolts out because I wanted to match it up because we're gonna replace it. And then of course, we got a really good set of forged connecting rods here with ARP bolts. And we've got a flat top forged two valve relief piston with a forged crankshaft. So we're definitely gonna reuse that crank and probably these rods once we check them out. But we're gonna change the pistons, like I said, because we want to run a tighter chamber on this and, and get some power out of it. The dart block also has a priority oiling system, which means that the, the mains and the rods are gonna get the oil first, unlike in the stock small block where the oil goes up top first into a main galley and so forth, and so the, the center galley, the upper galley first. So really stout block, it also comes with, you can get it in your dipstick on either side depending on what year of engine you have. So it's a very good block and we are gonna take this apart, clean it up, and then we're just gonna probably change the pistons 
holding the cylinders because this thing's fairly new. It's been bored to 30, I believe. So we're going to clean this up, get those other pistons on these rods, and get this thing back together. So I will take this lower end apart off camera, get the crank out, and then we'll come back and look at some of those parts. And then we'll talk about how we're going to improve this thing. Okay, so we've got all the pistons and rods out of this thing. This is our last one. We want to talk about this rod just a little bit. So we'll get this, this last one out here. Now this is a, a full floating pan. It's got a, you see it's got a C-clip in there and it's a flat top with two valve reliefs. These are forged pistons. This is a really good Icon piston. We're gonna save these, but for budget constraints, we're gonna go ahead and put a semi-floater on this rod. So we're gonna use the rod heater and heat it up, and we're gonna put a dished hyper-eutectic on here. Just because of the way that the compression ratio is gonna end up on this build, but these are really good pistons and they have hardly no time on them, so we're gonna save these. And of course, we've got a forged steel scat crank, and these are eagle rods. The one issue is gonna be the balancing, but what we're gonna do, this engine's already balanced, so this has a lot of a balancing work done to it. We're gonna go ahead and we're gonna weight match our new pistons to these, and then we'll just use uh, the rods that are already balanced to it. So, so yeah, uh, the crank looks good, the rods and pistons look good, so we'll get the, uh, get the crank out and we'll clean this block up. All right, so we've got the short block apart here. We're not gonna reuse any of these bearings. They don't look bad, but we're gonna go ahead and discard those. We're gonna hone the cylinders. I'm gonna run just a, a dingle ball through there. I, I did put a bore gauge in there, a couple of the cylinders, and man, I mean, these cylinders are in, in perfect shape. They just need a little bit of crosshatch in them. And then we'll run this through the jet wash so as you can see we've got all the rotating assembly parts apart here the crank looks good it does have a few scratches on the crank so we're going to go ahead and polish this up but i checked the size on it and it's like new and of course our, we're going to replace our, our timing chain and then these pistons so i'm going to go ahead and hone this block and get it washed and then we'll talk about changing these pistons out and polish this up and then we'll be ready to basically put this thing back together. So our next step is we've got all of our parts, our rods and pistons, our crank. We want to get the oil off that so we can work on it. This is our jet wash machine. You can see I hit the trigger there and it washes these with chemical. So we're going to shut the door and let that clean. You want to put a little spray oil in there. This is WD-40. You can use some light oil. And we just want to go really slow rotation here and rapid stroke. So we just barely touch the trigger on this. And we get an even stroke up and down. All right, guys, so this creates, a, I cut some of that out of the video. I did that for about a minute to a minute and a half, somewhere in there. This creates a lot of grit in here. What you want to do is if you're going to use this flex hone, you want to wipe this cylinder out as good as you can because this puts a lot of grit in there. This block has to be thoroughly cleaned after we hone it here. So you want to wipe it as clean as you can. And I like using WD-40. WD-40 was actually designed by NASA for cleaning parts, believe it or not. The reason they call it WD-40 because it's water displacing formula number 40. It took the engineer 40 tries to get the formula right. Then of course we're going to run this block through our jet wash machine and maybe the vat and just thoroughly clean it. You've got to get all that grit out of there otherwise it's going to destroy the engine. And you can see we've got a much better crosshatch here. We cleaned up this cylinder the cylinder sized right, like I said, but we've got a good cross hatch now. We're going to do that to all the cylinders and then we'll thoroughly clean the block. Another thing I would mention here and I'll kind of show you this as we go through it is there are gallery plugs in the front and the back of the block and some other locations. After you hone the thing or even before you hone it, but before you wash it for sure 
You want to make sure you remove all of these gallery plugs because sludge and crud gets down in there. And also we're going to remove the cam bearings and put new cam bearings in it because sludge will get in behind these cam bearings. We're not worried about doing that yet. We're going to go ahead and hone it and then we'll take all these plugs out and we'll submerge the block and clean it. We'll thoroughly clean it before we put it together. But while it's dirty now, we'll just go ahead and hone it, get all the cylinders honed and then once I get this washed, we'll come back and we'll talk about assembling this thing with our new parts and getting our really good heads on here and making some power. Alright, so now that we've got these run through the jet wash and degrease, we can work on this stuff without having a big oily mess everywhere. All right guys, so I washed the block. I finally washed the block. I, we honed the cylinders. You can see we've, we've got a, we did our honing. We got a good crosshatch pattern in here. We thoroughly cleaned the block in the jet wash and then finally washed it. I also replaced the cam bearings. Now the Dart block takes a special cam bearing and the GM cam bearing will work. You have to get these from Dart. And if, if you want, I can give you the part number on that. So our block is pretty much ready to go. Now um, uh, the crank also, we polished it and we're gonna put the crank in with new bearings. We have that basically stock flat tap it cam in there. Still in good shape, we're gonna use it for something else. But we are gonna be upgrading to all of this hydraulic roller goodness. This is a an ISKI 292 Mega Cam. And so we are, are gonna upgrade the cam from a flat tap it to a roller. And I'll kind of show you, there's, there's a little bit of a learning curve on the installation and stuff for the end play on the cam and I'll show you how we deal with that. So the next step is to go ahead and get the crankshaft in here and get this short block assembled. Once the short block is assembled, then we'll work on upgrading our camshaft valve train and heads on this thing. And also, um, executive decision, when we dyno this, we're going to run nitrous on it. So we're going to put this together and put maybe a 50 shot, nothing crazy. But uh, we want to get some power out of this. So we'll see how it goes. So we're going to go with a new timing set from Summit. This is a double roller with an adjustable gear. We're going to set it dot to dot. One of the things that is of note here is you have to pull the gear the old gear off the crankshaft now you can see we've got our crank in and torqued we've got our camshaft installed down here but in order to put the the new gear on you're going to have to get yourself a puller or you're going to have to have a machine shop pull this off because it is a press fit and it's on there pretty tight but with the correct puller, it's a snap. That gear will come off of there. Once you get it to that point, past the step, you can just kind of tap that gear off and it comes off. There's, so there's your little gear. And make sure you pay attention to the marks on this, guys. All right, so we've got the, the new timing set on here. We got our bolts in and torqued, and we got our mark set dot to dot. We're gonna degree this cam just to dial it in, make sure it's right. I'm not gonna do it on camera. But the one thing that I wanna talk to you about is the, the thrust of the cam, the forward and rearward movement here. The camshaft has to be able to move to the front and the rear. Now, with a flat tap at lifter, because the lifter is slightly spherical here and the lobe on the cam is angled, 
that keeps the cam from walking out of the block. With the roller cam, a lot of times you have to have some type of provision to keep the cam walking. We'll use a thrust button here in many cases between the cover and the cam. Those are kind of a pain in the butt to hook up. I really recommend for ease of use and accuracy is a, this timing cover. So this is a timing cover that I've used quite a bit in recent years, and it really makes setting the thrust on a roller cam a lot easier. So the part number on this is a 9-221. It's made by Cloys. You can get it from Summit Racing. So we open the package here. There's some instructions. Of course, a sticker if you're into that. And it's a two-piece cover. So it's a nice looking polished aluminum cover. You know, it's a nice, nice unit, nice piece. But you see, we've got this center section here. So if we open this up, there's a, there's an O-ring seal to seal this. And then there's four retaining bolts in here. But the really cool thing about this, you guys, is that this center piece here has a built-in thrust button on it. And so, and, and it's adjustable from the front side. So I can put my cover on and I can set my end thrust with this. I'm gonna, I wanna show you how to set this up because this is pretty cool. And it makes swapping from a flat tappet to a roller in one of the, in the earlier 350 block. Now this block has a provision for a retaining plate on the front and it has a provisions for the spider assembly in the lifter valley. So you could run the, you know, the factory roller setup, but we already had this stuff here. So it's just, you know, instead of buying a new cam and everything, we're going to run, we're going to run what you bung and uh, we're going to set this up. And all we got, this, this cover is only about 120 bucks or about something like that. It's a nice looking cover and it really makes installing this thing that the cam end thrust set makes it a snap. So I'll show you how we do that. So right now, if we take a little pry bar and we push that cam back and forth, if you watch here, you can see we've got a ton of movement here back and forth. So that cam on a roller cam is going to want to walk out of the block like that. Well, we can't have that thing doing that. So we're going to push it all the way back and we're going to go ahead and put our gasket on. This is the gasket that we're going to use with our cover. We're just going to put our gasket on the block because we want that's that's part of the part of the equation here. And we'll just take our cover without the centerpiece on it. And we'll go ahead and put this on the block. Okay, so we've got a couple of bolts in it here holding it on and that's where the cover is going to sit. And then we want to push the cam all the way back to its furthest point rearward and then just put your cover on your cover is only going to go on one way and we want to run these bolts in now this is adjustable we're going to take a little allen screw we're going to loosen this up and we can adjust the depth of that now right now this is not really going on because my thrust button is out too far it's out too far so i need to run it in so I need to loosen up, it's out too far this way. So I need to run this in, this thing is adjustable. So I need to loosen up this Allen key and I need to run this in until I get some clearance here. Because right now I'm sitting right up against the end of the cam and the plate will not go up. So I know that this is sticking out too far. Okay, so now I've loosened up the adjuster on the front here. You can see I've got that loose. And now I'm gonna take, if you look, you, you, can, you can run this thrust button out quite a bit this way, or I can run it in. I actually ran it in as far as it would go, which is about, right there. It was only out about four or five turns and it was too tight. So I'm gonna run this adjuster in as far as I can get it. And then I'm gonna put the plate on.
I've got my adjuster, my adjustment all the way in as far as it will go and my, it's too tight here. So sometimes you might have to shave this. They make this big on purpose. So I'm going to shave some material off this on my grinder and then we'll come back and see if we can get an adjustment out of this thing. So I had to take quite a bit off that thrust button to get it to fit, but I've got it in there and I've got my, I've got play now. Now there, here's how this works. If you look on the front of this, if you take the, the locking bolt out, this has a provision for a screwdriver. So I can take and I can rotate this. I can rotate the thrust button in and out. I'm gonna turn this clockwise, which is gonna run the thrust button in. Right now I've got my camshaft in here pushed all the way back and the thrust button is bottomed out this way. So this is as, as right, I'm going counterclockwise, it stops right there. I'm gonna turn this counterclockwise and I'm gonna run the thrust button in until I get up against the, you can see I'm turning that until I get up against the cam. So right there, my cam is pushed all the way back. I made sure of that. And my thrust button is run in and butted up against the cam. Now, that's gonna set this so it has no end play. The instructions tell you to back this off about one eighth of a turn. So we're going to go a little, about an eighth of a turn, which is right there. That is going to set your end play in here from between one and three thousandths. Now, when the engine warms up, that end play is going to increase a little bit because this aluminum timing cover is going to expand. So it's one to three thousandths when it's cold, and when it's hot, it's going to add a couple thousandths to that. So you're probably going to be anywhere from three to maybe five or six thousandths, which is perfectly fine for end play. Now you can also test this, but before you do, you want to put your set screw in here. Just go ahead and put the set screw in and we're going to tighten that and that's going to hold that thrust button in that position. So run your set screw all the way down. So get that good and snug. Then we're just going to make sure we have some end play here. We're going to check our movement on our cam here. Make sure that we have some movement. And we do. That cam has got a slight amount of, amount of movement back and forth, which is good. It's exactly what we want. And the cam is not going to walk out of the block. And that's it. That's how you set this up. Of course, I'm going to put the o-ring and stuff in here and gasket it correctly and put the seal in but this is set where it needs to be your end play is ready to go for your roller cam so that's really all there is to it guys so i've got the end play set on this thing i got it locked in we got about two and a half three thousand cent play and it looks good so now that we've got that done we can turn our attention to the pistons and rods so i thought i had the correct dish pistons for this motor but the set that I have is 30 over and this bore is standard, so I don't. So I ordered them, I'll pick them up tomorrow. So that's really all I can do for today. Um, I've got the, the rods prepped and set and ready to go. So once I get the rods and pistons together, we'll finish up the short block here, which, and again, I'm not gonna go into a lot of detail on that, I'm just gonna put it together. I'll show you the finished product. And then we will, start looking at our all of this goodness over here. I'm gonna CC the chamber, make sure we know what we got, and we'll put this together, and hopefully, uh, you know, with, within a day or two, we'll have this thing on the dyno. We gotta get this thing on the dyno, or we're gonna lose the shop! So, yeah, we're gonna lose the shop if we don't get this done. We got very limited time here, so. Uh, I'll be back, we'll get this thing going. Today I want to talk to you guys about compression ratio. Compression ratio is something that a lot of you have heard about, but a lot of people don't really understand it. Now when we're building engines and trying to modify an engine, the compression ratio of the engine is really important. One of the, one of the big aspects of compression ratio is we want the compression ratio to be as high as possible to get more power. However, we are limited by the type of fuel we're gonna run. Now, if you're gonna run pump gas, 
87, 91 octane, whatever, 91 is the one we're usually going to look at because we can, we can buy that. It costs a little more than 87, but that's going to get our compression up a little higher to where it's livable. You guys have all seen factory cars, like my wife has a Lexus, and it says premium fuel only. That's because it has higher compression. So one of the things that we try to do is get the compression up to the point where it's going to make good power, but if we're going to run pump gas, we have to keep it to a level where we're not going to have pre-ignition. What happens if you have too much compression is you have to run higher octane fuel. Now octane in a fuel is literally the fuel's resistance to burning. So a higher octane fuel is going to take more heat to ignite that fuel. The problem with going too high of a compression with pump gas is the heat that is generated in there by the compression of the air and fuel is going to reach ignition temperature. So what happens is before the spark plug actually fires, the fuel ignites and you get what we call pre-ignition. Now pre-ignition is really bad, it can destroy engines. Here's a good example of that. Had a customer several years ago bring me an engine and he had some random guy build this engine for him. He paid him a bunch of money and he got the thing in and it never ran right. It was spark knocking and pinging and it had all kinds of issues. He got about 150 to 200 miles on it and the thing just wouldn't even run. It, it was smoking and, and using oil and backfiring and it had no power. So he brought me the engine and I have one of the pistons here that I took out of that engine. I want you to take a good look at this. This is only with about 150 miles on that engine. It literally melted that piston. This is caused by pre-ignition. Now what happened with this engine is the guy that built it, because he didn't really understand what he was doing, he had an extra set of heads there and he said, oh, you know what, they're small block Chevy heads, we'll just use these because they're good heads and yours are junk or whatever. So the heads that they took off was a standard 350 head. It had, this is just a cutaway of a 350 head, it had a 76 cc chamber head here. Now the combustion chamber is part of that com compression ratio equation like we'll learn about in a little bit. What he did is they took a set of 305 HO heads which had a 58 cc chamber head here. So we went from 76 cc's and this was much tighter, much smaller, 58. Well, I ran the numbers on it and with that 58 cc chamber on a 30 over 350, which is what this is, even with a recessed piston, he had about 11.2 to one compression. Now, he was expecting to run this in his work truck with 87 octane. Well, if you run 11.2 to 1 compression with iron heads on 87 octane, this is what you get. So we got to watch our compression ratio because if the customer or you are planning on running pump gas, you know, if you're going to run race gas, no problem, but it's 8 to $10 a gallon. So most people don't want to do that. So we got to watch our compression ratio. So compression ratio is literally this. It is the volume difference between bottom dead center and top dead center. So in other words, when my piston is at its lowest point of travel in the cylinder, how much space is above that piston? And that includes the combustion chamber on the head. The other volume that we're comparing is when this piston goes up to top dead center, how much space is above that piston at top dead center, which is basically the space above the piston at top dead center is your deck clearance. That's how far down in the bore the piston sits. It's get the gasket thickness, because remember the gasket thickness is controlling where that head sits. A thicker gasket is going to move the head further away from the top of the piston and make that area bigger. A thinner gasket is going to move the head in the chamber closer to the piston. It's going to make this area smaller. So we have to consider the gasket thickness, the deck clearance, and the combustion chamber volume. All of those are the equation in here. I'm literally looking at the area above the piston, how much area do I have, including the gasket thickness in the chamber, and then I'm running this up to TDC and I'm saying, when I'm at top dead center, this chamber area, how much area do I have above the piston? It's a ratio. So 
this area up here where the combustion chamber is, if it takes 10 of these to fill up this area, then the compression ratio is obviously 10 to 1. Now, the factors that control it are this, the top of the piston. This is a flat top piston. It has a flat top with four valve reliefs. This is a dished piston. It has four valve reliefs, but you can see it has a big recess here. It has about a 14.5 cc recess. So this piston here is going to add 14.5 cc's to this area up here, which is going to make it larger, which is going to lower the compression ratio. Now, if I'm really doing a performance motor and I want to beef that up, I can get a dome piston. Now, this is going to make that area, when it comes up, the area up here is going to be much smaller. So I'm pushing the same volume into a much smaller area, which is going to raise the compression ratio. So compression ratio is really a comparison of volume above the piston at bottom dead center and volume above the piston at top dead center. Now we have to measure these things each one at a time in order to calculate this. So here's what you need to know. You need to know the bore size of your engine, right? You need to know the stroke of the crank, so you need to know how far that piston is going to travel from bottom to top. We need to know our combustion chamber volume. We need to know our compressed gasket thickness. Now again, we can get different thicknesses of gasket. This gasket here is 45 thousandths compressed. This one is a steel shim gasket. It is 15 thousandths shim, uh, 15 thousandths compressed. So there's a dramatic difference between these two gaskets. So you can pick and choose what gasket you want. You want to keep this around 9.5, 10 to 1 with iron heads on pump gas. So if you're building a Street 350 and you want to run pump gas, these are all things that you need to consider. If you're changing heads like we did on our 350 here, if you go from a 76cc chamber to a 64cc chamber, that's going to change some stuff. It's going to raise your compression. Now generally on a stock 350, going from 76 to 60, 64 is not going to put you out of pump gas range, mainly because the 350 with the open chamber and if it has a dished piston, most of them have a dish like this, they're like 8 to 1 compression from the factory. So if you put on a set of 64 cc's, then you're going to be fine. But if you do machine work like deck the block and machine the heads and and put a thinner gasket on, things like that, you got to really watch this. You might get out of pump gas range. So all of this stuff has to be checked. We have to CC the combustion chambers. We have to know our bore and stroke. We have to know our gasket thickness. There's actually a really good calculator online once you know these numbers. It's called RSR Compression Ratio Calculator. Just type that into Google and it'll ask you for all these parameters. And once you know that, it will tell you so our next step, we're short blocking the lower end of our engine here. We got our pistons with the new Molly rings and so forth. And we're putting the bottom end together. And now that that's done, we can start looking at getting our new cylinder heads on this thing. Now that we've got the short block together, I think I need to ex explain a little bit about this to you guys. I know earlier in the video I talked about how that we ordered dish pistons for this because we wanted our engine to be pump gas friendly. We actually ended up putting the flat tops in here with the two valve reliefs because once we, we CC the chambers on our performance, this is our cylinder head that we're going to run and this is an Edelbrock E-Tech 200. I actually had a set of trick flows that I wanted to put on here that had a much tighter chamber, but we ended up needing special rockers and stuff for those that we didn't have, and it, it just didn't work out. E-Tech's work pretty good. They have a 200cc intake runner. They have a, a 202 valve on the intake and a 1600 exhaust. We CC'd the chamber, which means we put a spark plug in here, we seal it off with plexiglass. You've seen me do that in some other videos. and. We filled it with liquid and it, it held about 63 cc's. Now they're 64 cc's uh, when they are new, but we have milled these a little bit. We just skim cut them. So we've got a 63 cc chamber 
and then we checked our deck height and our engine our deck height is really near zero we got about maybe five down in the hole so we did the calculations and we came up with just a little over 10 to 1 like 10.3 to 1 well with aluminum heads we're perfectly fine up to 11 to 1 with uh, you know 93 octane so because of that we ended up going with the flat tops in here and now that the short blocks together the next thing to do is put on all this goodness right here and we just very gently install our freshly machined E-Tech 200 head and we'll be in business now you don't want to walk away from this so you get a nut and a washer on it so I always make sure that I have at least one of these handy. Now real important when you got ARP studs or bolts, with aluminum heads especially, make sure you use the washer that goes on here. You don't want to put these nuts on just right onto the head, it'll tear the head up. So we're going to go ahead and use the washer, and if you have the ARP lube you can use that on here. These studs have been used quite a few times on this particular engine, so these run down finger tight right you don't need to tighten it up I'll go ahead and get the rest of the washers on here along with the other head and then we will be well on our way to uh, getting this thing on the dyno and making some power so the rocker arm that we decided on for this is we bought a new set of comp cams part number is 1048 it's a 1.5 to one ratio. We didn't want to go bigger on the ratio because our lift is where we want it to be. But this is a really good set of true full roller rockers. They are a bit on the expensive side. They're around 500 bucks. But you know, you get what you pay for with rockers. So I'm going to have to figure out the push rod length on this thing because I don't know where it's at right now. I'm going to put my push rod length checker in here and we're going to go ahead and measure it up and order the correct hardened push rods for this. That's my next step. So once I figure that out and get the right push rods, uh, I'll come back and we'll talk about valve adjustment and stuff. And we'll get these nice rockers on here and uh, try to button up this valve train. Okay, guys. So we've got, I've got the, uh, I figured out the push rod. I bought the correct length push rod. And we've got our comp cams rollers on here. The next thing we need to do is adjust these valves. I want to walk you through the valve adjustment on there's a couple of different ways to do valve adjustment when you have a big roller cam it is actually very mandatory to do it the way i'm going to show you right now so here's what we're going to do so i'm going to zero in on these two we can do one cylinder at a time when you start off with this you've got lash so that up and down movement right there is obviously lash you also need a way to rotate the engine the roller cams have a really small base circle so it's important that you follow the procedure I'm going to show you because there's some other methods like the firing order method and some other ways to do this, but those usually don't adjust the rollers correctly, you end up with loose rockers. So what you want to do, we're going to start with our intake valve here. This is our intake valve on our head right here, this first one. What we're going to do is we're going to rotate the engine until we see this exhaust valve over here start to come up. You'll see this start to move. So this is our intake. We want to watch our exhaust and we're going to rotate our engine until that exhaust just comes up and starts to rise off that base circle. So I'm rotating this and we're going to get around here till that exhaust to where that exhaust opens. Okay right now that exhaust just started to open. It just if you saw that I'll back it up a little bit and you watch right here, that exhaust just started to come up off its base circle. When that happens here on this exhaust, guys, we're going to go over to the intake here. That's going to put this intake on its base circle. So we're going to come over here, and we have to get rid of this lash here. So we're going to go down with our poly lock here, and we're just going to run it down until that up and down movement goes away. So right now, I just pinched the push rod between the rocker by running this down and the plunger and the lifter. So I have no up and down movement. Now I can spin that push rod real easy. You'll hear guys that tell you that you need to go down till you can't spin that push rod. That is absolutely wrong. Don't do it that way. You're gonna, you're, you're, some of your valves are gonna be a lot tighter than others if you do that. So now 
I'm at zero lash, and right up here, I'm going to go the specified turn. On this one, you can go a half to a full turn. We're going to go one half turn on this, and then we're going to lock this in place. So we just take our five eighths here, and we're going to go right there. I want almost a half a turn. Then we're going to take and lock our jam nut in here. I'm going to go ahead and lock this and get it good and tight. And then we're going to go the rest of that turn and make sure that that jam nut is locked in place. That rocker is now adjusted. Now, to do the exhaust, we're going to open the intake valve. So my exhaust is opening. You're going to see it open. There it goes. It's fully adjusted now. It's going to go all the way back down. And now the intake's going to open. Now on the intake, it's a little different here, guys. We're going to watch that intake valve. That intake valve is going to open all the way. And we're going to wait till it just starts to drop. It just starts to close. And we're going to stop right there. So if you watch real close here, you can see the rocker too. I'm still coming up. And now it just started to close. I'll back up so you can see that. So I'm going to back up. See it's coming up. It's opening. And there it just started to drop back down. That's going to put your exhaust over here on the same cylinder on its base circle. So we come over here and we do the same thing. So we got this lash. So we're going to run this down until the lash goes away. I'm just running it down. Now I have no up and down play there. I'm going to go a half a turn. I'm actually going to go two thirds of a half there. Then I'm going to run my locking nut down. Get it good and snug. And I'm going to go the rest of that half turn. And then I'm going to, again, I'm going to make sure that jam nut's tight. Now those two valves right there are adjusted. You can go through and do every cylinder like that. I won't do that all on camera. But it is important that you understand that this really, if you're going to put a performance roller cam in, this is really the only way you can adjust these and get onto that base circle. I've tried other methods and with a roller, you can get away with the fire and order method and so forth if you have a small flat tap of cam. But if you got a big roller like we got here, it does not work. You have to use this method. So I'll, I'm going to go ahead and get all the rest of these adjusted and then uh, we're getting close. I'm getting excited. We're going to button this thing up and get her on the dyno and make some horsepower. One of the, one of the things that I would recommend is this Felpro gasket. The part number is an MS98000T and this is a rubber infused, a, a steel gasket that's rubber infused and the nice thing is it's, it's designed for basically an aftermarket intake or a carbureted intake. We've got 200 cc runners here and this gasket is actually large enough that it doesn't block off any of that port. So it works really well with aftermarket heads. They have just the, the composite material type gaskets that they sell from Mr. Gasket and some other people. Those always seem to blow out. These steel based rubber infused gaskets from Felpro I have had absolutely no problems with these blowing out with the Vortec style head, the Vortec bolt pattern. So we're, we're going to go, we got, we got these on, we're going to lay a bead of silicone here and here and then we'll go ahead and we'll set our intake down on there. So also we want a big thick bead of silicone across the front and the back. Don't use the gaskets that go in there because those always leak. And I would put a little bit of silicone on the bottom of the top of the gasket on each corner where the water jackets are. And then we're going to take our intake and we're going to set it straight down on. Our studs in there for our intake. So we're just going to line this up and we're going to go straight down on our gaskets. Just like that. Then we'll get our nuts and washers on here and torque them. Now as far as the torque on your Vortex style intake here guys, do not over torque this intake. The torque on this is about 13 foot pounds. If you over torque these, this thing will leak because there's no center bolts in here. So follow the manufacturer specs for torque specs and everything will be fine. Okay guys, so our next step, we are 
a day or two has passed and we have got our engine on the dyno cart and we got a few more things to button up we got to put the starter on we got to find a set of valve covers for it and a few other plugs and so forth uh, the, of course the coolant pump get a I went ahead and ordered a new quick fuel 750 CFM carb I think I talked about that earlier just because we don't want to have any trouble and we put a spacer on this we may run nitrous on this if so we'll add a nitrous spacer here but we're going to run it NA first and see what we can do over stock and I think the numbers will be impressive so uh, we're getting closer all right guys so as you can see we bring out the much got the engine dressed and ready to run um, I had the valve covers and the plugs in it when we put the dyno cart up I didn't pull the valve cover or the number one spark plug to stab the distributor. I just put the mark at number one, so we could be 180 out. And the only reason I did that is because I'm lazy. Uh, so my goal right now is just I want this thing to fire. We've got everything to the point where we think it's ready to fire, although the distributor is loose. So we're not going to do anything crazy. We just want to see if it'll light up. So let's see what happens here. Yeah, we're there. All right, let me dial it in and we'll make some passes.